Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're going to have a discussion about investments. Um, as journalist with TechCrunch for the last uh, 300 years, uh, it's been great, by the way. Um, the two things that entrepreneurs always say to me is that is the is the key to what they're doing is people and money. So we'll talk about the money, and we've got a great panel here because. Um, what's great is that we've got a really great international perspective as well as a great London perspective. Um, first of all, let, I think that uh, we're allowed a couple of opening statements. So um, just to introduce, if, I, if we go in from my right, we'll get a little, maybe a, a sort of a quick download on what everyone is doing, what everyone's working on. You'll get to know them a bit more. We've got about 35 minutes to get through this. They said no Q&A, but I'm not sure. I might rebel against that. Um, so first of all, first of all, let's hear from uh, Ali uh, Tamasab. Round of applause from Ali from DCVC. Good to see you, everyone. I'm with. Uh, I'm coming from San Francisco. I'm with a venture capital firm called DCVC Data Collective. We invest in deep tech and applied AI. Uh, over a billion dollars assets under management, and we are early stage venture capital firm. Very excited to be here. To talk about how data is, is disrupting venture and how venture is disrupting AI. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, short um, intro. I'll ask yeah. the questions later. Okay. Kim yeah. Police, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Kim Police, one of the pioneers of the tech industry in uh, the last uh, few years in Silicon Valley, and now an investor. Kim, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I am, uh, just tell you briefly a little about the work I'm doing right now. I've been a founder of various technology companies over the year and an angel investor and realized that, as many of us have, uh, startup investing is broken. The venture model is broken in many ways uh, when it comes to returns from venture funds and also when it comes to access to capital for founders. And also geographies. When, the, uh, when you look at the startup economies, they're very concentrated in just a few parts of the world. So. I've co-founded a company called CrowdSmart four years ago. We use AI and collective intelligence to actually create a prediction model for startup investing. And we use a combination of collective intelligence, which is the science of cognitive diversity. You make better predictions when you have groups of cognitively diverse people who are making those predictions. And we apply AI, machine learning, natural language processing, Bayesian learning, to what the collective intelligence of the community says. And we create a quantitative score that actually predicts the probability of return on investment for a particular company. We actually raised a small fund about three years ago to test the prediction accuracy of the, the platform, and we've invested in about 25 companies now. 80% have gone from C to Series A. The rest are doing fine, so no one's gone under. Uh, we've also tracked the companies that did not score high, and for the most part, they did not go on to, to raise funding, so that's an interesting indicator. Also, 40% of these companies are founded by women, the top scoring companies, which was not intended. So we think it's a side result of reducing ingrained bias, which is what happens when you are actually being assessed on what you know, not who you know. So it's early days, small data set, but we're, we're pretty excited about the potential to take this global. I can talk more about it. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Kim, please. Thank you. And next, last of all, let's hear now from Nick Brisbane from Forward Partners. Nick. So, uh, so briefly about Forward Partners. We founded Forward Partners six years ago now, and we're a pre-seed and seed stage fund uh, here in London. Uh, and two things that are uh, different uh, and hopefully interesting about us. So firstly, we work with uh, a lot of companies from day one, actually day one of their existence. That's about half of our portfolio. It's a very early stage. And secondly, we have um, a big value add team that, that we keep inside our, our fund, which is there to help our portfolio companies to have more success and, and have it more quickly. Uh, and to the kind of the question that, that's in front of us today on this panel, you know, what's changing the investment in the investment landscape? There's, there's a lot that's changing actually in a very positive way, a lot of great innovations for founders. Our vision at Ford Partners is a world where every founder realizes their potential and some of the things that are happening these days are getting us more towards that, but we've got a couple of big challenges actually, one of which um, talks to what Kim was just describing. Uh, so firstly, 90% of startups still fail, it's been stuck that way for 25 years now, uh, and that's way too high. You can bring that down, um, and, and I look at the, the part of our portfolio that we've invested in on day one, that's trending towards a 50% success rate, and when we analyze that, 
part of, uh, part of the higher success comes because we help founders to make better decisions about whether they should start their companies or not in the first place. You know, that's a big deal, and that, that really talks to, to what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing is that um, because of the value add team we help, we uh, bring experience of working across uh, 50 odd startups, and so we get high quality people into our companies more quickly, and they uh, learn the lessons of entrepreneurs that have gone before them to a much greater extent. So we can really drive down that failure rate. We'll bring more entrepreneurs into the ecosystem. Uh, we'll get more innovation. And ultimately, that's the big win here. Uh, it gives us more job creation, more economic growth. Thank you very much, Nick. Right, let's go straight into it. You mentioned, um, Kim, you mentioned uh, machine learning and AI. I know, for instance, that VC, uh, DCVC, sorry. It's like ACDC, which way around does it go? Um, <laughs> You are very interested in machine learning and AI. As a journalist, I get probably 20 emails a day from entrepreneurs saying, we are machine learning, we are machine learning driven, we are AI driven. Is this really just a PR strategy? And how can you tell the difference when you're talking to an entrepreneur? Well, I, I think so. I think absolutely a big part of it is PR strategy. And you know, machine learning AI today is software, it's coding of 10 years ago. So this is just a new wave. Now machine learning is just a tool set in, in part of the tools that a lot of companies are using today. And I think the way to identify them is, is twofold. So some sort of companies are developing new types of machine learning models. So companies that are at the forefront of pushing AI in the academic side. So companies like Primer AI, companies like Element AI who are developing new models for, for themselves. And then on the other side, for AI, we need data. So it's companies that are developing their own data. So not using you know, third-party data, companies like Planet Labs that are gathering data from the, from the Earth, companies that are gathering health data, companies that are gathering medical imaging data. And so I think if either they own the data or they own the, the AI front and developing it on that front, otherwise mostly I see, I see it as PR or just, just a part of the toolbox. Does that mean if you're not in AI, you're screwed? Not necessarily, probably at this time, but in two, three years, or even probably now, it's, it's like you know, a company is a software company. Of course it's a software company. Of course it's an AI company. You're using data, you're, you're building something new. So I, I don't think you're screwed, but it's, it's just as normal as, hey, I have an app. Kim, you're using machine learning in part, as part of your investment strategy. Um, does that mean you automatically discard entrepreneurs who aren't you also uh, employing those those new tools? Oh, not at all, no. Um, so let me just maybe take a step back. The, what, we, what we do is actually we work with accelerators, top accelerators, uh, investors, accelerators all over the US and, and the world to source startups of all different kinds. So they don't, they're not just AI startups. They could be biotech or robotics or whatever. Um, we then assemble a group of cognitively diverse experts. So 30 to 40 people at a time will score a startup um, we ask open-ended questions, like, do you find this a compelling investment opportunity? If so, why? What are your top concerns? And then we ask specific questions around product market fit, team, IP, traction. And we use NLP, National Language Processing, to, to actually analyze every word that is spoken. And we create uh, themes. There's a knowledge model, a knowledge map that's created out of the conversation that results. It's an open-ended conversation. People can upvote each other's ideas, and founders can answer questions. This is all virtual. It happens over three to four weeks. And then out of that, we're using machine learning to analyze what the themes are that resulted. And over time, we plug every analysis of every startup into this model. So we are able to create a system that identifies patterns that indicate whether this company has a pri high probability of return on investment, a positive return this sounds, on investment. This sounds like the, the, the holy grail of investing, though. <laughs> if you get this right, isn't this the equivalent of uh, winning the, uh, you know, working out how to beat the house at every casino in, in town? <laughs> if, if we get it right, we think we can take this everywhere in the world where there's abundant talent and abundant capital, but the capital is not finding the talent. And if we can actually unlock that capital by creating a quantitative score to increase the confidence on the part of the investor, we can create startup ecosystems everywhere. And that's really the vision here. The problem is, is that at early stage, certainly, you're talking about investors having to deal with entrepreneurs 
on a one-to-one -one basis, get to know them as human beings. Um, time and again, I hear entrepreneurs say that the best way that they work with their, their investors is you know, literally sort of staring them in the eye kind of thing. Um, how can your machine learning and natural language process platform um, you know, create that environment? So what we're focusing on is the seed stage. So this is that basically once you've raised a little bit of friends and family money, maybe you know, up to 150K or something, you're raising a seed round now. And what happens is over a three to four week period during these open-ended conversations that happen online, there's also live Q&As with the founders. The founders can also respond to the questions and are actually very actively involved in So it's like sort of the virtual the dragon stand. Yes, Shark exactly. Tank. That, that's exactly right. And we're, we're creating an, basically a whole knowledge model. We're creating a data model out of all of the conversation that results over that month-long period. Nick, Nick, do you feel concerned that, uh, that Kim's CrowdSmart platform is basically going to put you out of a job now because you're... She's coming in from space like a Klingon battleship. You, uh, you, you know, you're trying to kind of you know, run around London on the tube. The, the weather's terrible. What, what, how can you scale what you do? Um, so look, I think anything that helps founders to understand whether they're likely to get funded or not is net good in the world, um, definitely, and so that'd be a big help. Uh, but no, I don't. And, and I'm going to go out on a, a bit of a limb here at an AI conference and say that... Um, and I may never get invited back, uh, <laughs> say that I don't think AI is going to fundamentally uh, disrupt venture capital any time, let's say, in the next five to ten years. And let me explain why. And then I will explain, you know, we have got a couple of AI projects going. I'll explain them, but they operate at the margins of the business. So the big challenge you have in venture capital, that we saw 4,000 business plans last year. We invested in eight. Okay, and so if you look at the, uh, the data set that you've got, there's a lot coming in, but the kind of the number of uh, success cases that you've got to pattern match on is very small. That's the first challenge. And then the second challenge is the feedback cycle is, um, you know, average time to exit for these businesses, if we do a good job, is going to be five to seven years. And so the, the time to feed back into the, into the model to make it smarter is, is five to seven years. And so, you know, that is just, you know, it's going to be a long time before we can go, Here's the, here are the 4,000 business plans, tell us which eight we should invest in. What you can do in the short term, uh, and these are the two things we have going, uh, we've got a, uh, at the most trivial end, we've got a bot that crawls LinkedIn uh, and uh, finds suitable founders on a, a bunch of criteria that, we, uh, that we're looking at, industry sectors, where they change their job status and so on, uh, and we reach out to them, uh, one. And then two, perhaps more interestingly, so 4,000 plans, 400 meetings last year, uh, and so the, kind of one of the big challenges in venture is where your team spends their time, how they go from the 4,000 to the 400. Uh, and there, there is enough signal. There, I think we can build um, some kind of machine learning algorithm where you feed it the, and it's quite complicated, right? You need to feed it the email train and the PDF, and it needs to look for the signals in that um, to tell you, okay, this is 90% chance you're going to want to meet this one, 10% chance you're going to want to meet this one, and that will allow our team to, to just process the deal flow more efficiently, maybe allow us to open the funnel a bit, a bit wider at the top. So that would be great, and we're doing it, but to put some numbers around that, that's probably, you know, at the moment, that kind of 4,000 to 400, there's two people on our team do that. It's maybe half their time, probably a bit less. And so there's something real to be had there, but it's not, you know, it's not going to be transformative. But um, let's talk about trends. So we, there's a, a great report out today saying that uh, yada, yada, Britain's doing really well in tech. Uh, it's the usual thing. It's from Tech Nation. They're paid by the government to say this sort of thing. Um, uh, and then there's, uh, then there's Silicon Valley, we know is booming, of course, um, never been bigger. We're at, there's several thousand millionaires about to be created, or have been created because of the Uber IPO. The, you know, the juggernaut that is Silicon Valley is, is un, unassailable. The European tech scene has got bigger by huge magnitude over the last 10 years. Is location going to continue to be a factor? I mean, you seem to be saying that location is gradually going to be less of a factor. Uh, you're obviously building your ecosystem in, in Washington. Um, how much of... Not in how, Washington, Silicon Valley. Sorry, Silicon Valley, sorry. DCV. Oh, yeah. It's because your name puts me off, DCVC. <laughs> um, is because, um, you know, how much of location is still going to be a, fa a factor, or is it, is, is it, can anyone get funded from anywhere, Ali? 
Um, so we, we fund internationally. We have companies in New Zealand, we have companies in the UK, we have companies in Europe and Canada, but still mostly in the US. We, we invest in, in founders and technical expertise and where we see deep technical uh, expertise. And I, I tend to see one reason we may not invest in companies that are kind of further ahead from us or a problem that I'm seeing is, is the level of ambition and people who can take it from a $100 million company to a $10 billion company. So we see a lot of talent in Europe and especially in the UK, a lot of AI and deep tech, but we don't necessarily always see the leaders who can take them to become massive successes. So I, I think with more investment, with more cycles, in, in these regions, we can see more successful people who have created large companies to stay in and develop the next and the next and the next. So it's, it's probably just a matter of time. London has become a big international centre. You have entrepreneurs coming from all over the place. Nick, um, is London still a factor or is it, uh, are, we, are you getting incoming from everywhere? Uh, we do get incoming from everywhere. We get our best incoming from London and the UK for sure. Um, so it is a factor? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I'm... Uh, early stage investing, you, you alluded to it right at the start, um, is about personal chemistry, personal relationships between VC and investor. Uh, and, uh, and so for seed and pre-seed, you do need to um, have people on the ground. But what is definitely happening is, you know, 30 years ago, Silicon Valley was the only show in town, uh, only show on the planet. <laughs> uh, and now we've got sizable ecosystems big enough to be self-sustaining in a bunch of other places, London included. Um, and we will continue to see more of that, but I think it will cluster in, uh, in, in a number of key cities. What do you think, Kim? I think, uh, again, I just go back to capital is abundant everywhere and talent is abundant everywhere. And the problem is they don't meet each other, they don't connect. And what I'd, I think one of the most powerful things uh, around the world are universities. And there are communities around universities, and increasingly there are accelerators. Stanford, universities. Silicon Valley, etc. <laughs> and everywhere else in the yeah. world. Um, and there's, there's a, a community of, of uh, people who care, alums, alums, people in industry, uh, obviously academics, and students with energy who want to take technologies and innovations and go start companies. And obviously they don't have experience in doing so, but over time that, get, that can develop. And one of the things we do is we partner with accelerators everywhere and funds, micro VCs, family offices are also, you know, wealthy families are increasingly interested in funding startups coming out of their countries, their geographies. So we're, we're not actually another fund competing with funds, we're providing yeah. technology to yeah. funds and to accelerators. And so I'm encouraged, I'm, I'm optimistic that this can, can change more quickly than perhaps, you know, a generation. That it, that it seems like it's taken to get some of the, the other cities, uh, or geographies around the world to be able to compete on uh, reasonably equal footing with Silicon Valley. Uh, and again, I think it's about empowering what already exists, tapping into what already exists, the talent and the capital. One of the trends over the last few years, if you look at it, is that is that there's been a bifurcation in, in, in terms of investing, is that a lot of investors have gone earlier and earlier stage because they don't want to miss out on that next Uber um, that's kind of skulking away at the back of a pitch contest or whatever. And they don't, and then uh, once you get past the A's and the B's and what have you, you, um, you're, you know, you're fine, you're cooking with gas, you can raise as much money as you like, you can stay private as long as you like, you just tap, tap on the door of SoftBank and, um, and continue to raise until you're ready for an enormous IPO. But the people who get past pre-seed to, towards A, the people who get to A, the, there's a sort of a valley of death after A to some extent often, isn't there? Why do you think that's happened and what do you think we can do about it? What do you think? So um, I, I think there is uh, one part of this is because of the abundance of capital. Uh, interest rates are low, so people tend to raise more, funds tend to raise more, and they're doing more full stack. They're trying to get in as early as they can and some funds are trying to basically cover the growth stage as well. Um, I think one reason we have this value of death is probably the, the, the valuations. So these companies keep raising more and more and by the time they are you know, valued at $200 million and they are a large you know, Series B, Series C company, their revenues don't justify, so it's hard to get them and find VCs uh, who can cover that part. And there's so many VCs covering this pre-seed and seed 
uh, and maybe A stage and so many, so little uh, VC firms who are covering the B and C and D stage and then there's SoftBank and kind of the IPO stage or the pre-IPO stage. Uh, so yes, there's, there's not enough VCs there um, and there is probably a mismatch of what, what valuations these companies reach by when they're at Series B and there's no investor who sees how I can multiply my capital by a large factor at that point. Do you, can, do you see terms improving because there's been so much competition over the last few years at this super early stage? Um, you know, are are entrepreneurs it, getting a good deal? <laughs> it depends on, I think, the geography to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, you'll see valuations much higher than the same company would have gotten any, anywhere else. So there is some sort of a level of insanity um, that comes with the exuberance. Uh, I would say in terms of valley of death, though, it's, it's really seed to Series A because there's so much, so many companies get seed funding, but they just can't get to a Series A. And the Series A size, fund sizes have gotten so much larger. So, you know, you now have pre-seed, seed, you know, super seed. Mezzanine seed. <laughs> yeah. Late seed. Well, right, exactly. And then, you know, the other challenge is for, for um, the investors who are looking at, you know, seed deals and whether they, they should get follow-on funding is the diligence, the process of diligence, you know, and it's, this is one of the areas that for non sort of institutional VCs, if you're a family office or you're a micro VC or you're a corporate VC, you don't have the resources to do the diligence that you need to do. So that becomes an issue on the investor side, which is, which is why, again, this, this different approach here of using cognitive diversity, a collective community to do the scoring and creating a quantitative model is, is sort of better than what often happens, which is reaching out to your friend, do you know something about this, this area, or throwing a dart and hoping, you know, because somebody smart invested in them already, and there's that herd yeah. mentality that, that Nick, uh, Nick, unfortunately you, is too much of a factor. Four partners, you make, you make a relatively quite a big thing about um, how, um, uh, you know, you're very much also a company builder, aren't you? You put tools around the entrepreneurs. Um, do you find that it's that value add that helps these companies? And what do you think about the value of DAF issue? Uh, thank you for the question. Definitely, <laughs> definitely was keen to talk about that. So uh, rather than kind of value add that we put around, we like to think of it as a, as a platform, a set of tools and services that we provide. Uh, um, you know, founders succeed because they are great entrepreneurs, ultimately not because of any wrapping that we put around them. Uh, but, you know, so I believe that if we provide a good set of tools, a better set of tools than any other investor, then we'll win the best deals uh, and, and the companies that we back will grow faster and have more success as a result. Uh, and uh, so it's early days. Um, but the model is, is looking like it's working. Um, uh, I described earlier the feedback cycle for a, uh, for a machine learning business which analyzes, or a machine learning algorithm analyzing investment success, but it's the same for new venture capital models. So, so we're six years in uh, and the proof will be in the pudding, will come out in another four or five years or so. Um, and right now companies in the portfolio are, are raising money at ever increasing valuations, the revenues are growing nicely, but, but you know, we haven't, we haven't got the big exits yet, which Ultimately, um, ultimately, would be the mark of whether the whole model works or not. But uh, I, I believe it will get there, and you know, more, more and more people are putting money behind us to uh, to concur with that. And to the to the kind of Series B and C point, um, or valley of death, valley wherever of death. you think the valley yeah. of death is. So, so, so in the UK right now, I would say it is Series B and C. And, and for me, it's a, it's a market question. The you know, so when I started in this game 20 years ago, the kind of there was no value of death, it was all death, wasn't it, pretty much? <laughs> the, the, uh, there, was, there was this kind of brief bubble in 1990,000 and then and there was no money for anything really. Uh, and then slowly we got more C funds and Series A funds uh, and that part of the market is relatively well funded. And now we've got all these uh, much later stage funds as well, then uh, that's creating much more opportunity in, in Series B and Series C. Uh, and friends of mine who are entrepreneurs in the venture capital industry, that's where they're increasingly focused now. That's where people are trying to raise the new funds. Uh, and I think and hope that they'll be successful. Um, uh, and at that point, the value of death will kind of move somewhere else in the, in the chain. Um, now, we, you know, it's 2019, and I think probably 10, 15 years ago, people thought, you know, the, the venture capital would, industry would uh, sort of continue trundling along more or less as it had done since the 90s and then there was 
a whole load of new funds, and then uh, a whole load of, uh, obviously, more and more exits later on, uh, which then created more entrepreneurs. Certainly in Europe, we've seen entrepreneurs become investors in their own right. You look at someone like Alex Chesterman from Zoopla, who's now, who you'll never get on a stage, by the way. We call him all the time. Alex, come and get on a stage. No, beep, flat line. Um, so if you see him, say hi from me. Um, uh, but he's, an, he's a serial investor now. So that's all fantastic. But the model also changed. So we ended up with crowdfunding from the likes of Crowdcube, Cedars, equity crowd rounds from these guys. It still seems early days from some of those crowd equity crowdfunding things. What do you think? Do you think that's kind of, you know, uh, jump the shark, to use that phrase? Um, or do you think it's going to be around for a little bit longer? Anyone? Ali? Um, well, so what, what I like about crowdfunding and especially equity crowdfunding is giving access to everyone basically democratizing this access to invest in this very early stage companies. However, I think VCs, the, the main value add is, as Nick and, and their firm, is, is in building companies and helping and picking the professional teams. So on one side, I'm happy that this gives access to non-VCs and non-professional investors to get better access. But on the other side, I feel like the best companies today, that if you look at the best companies, they are comp they're venture-backed companies rather than companies coming out of equity crowdfunding or something of that sort. And no one else. Well, you know, the, the, the sort of vision of crowdfunding is many more companies can get access to capital. Uh, you don't have to know someone in the venture capital industry. And, and that's a wonderful thing. The problem is that it's also the potential for a lot of regular folks to lose a lot of money. And, and so the, that's one of the reasons that, again, we're taking the approach we are which is creating a, a quantitative scientific model around analyzing, does this company actually have a chance of But can anyone a ap apply to your platform, or is it only uh, qualified investors? Uh, today, we only allow qualified investors to invest in these companies, but we're in the process of partnering with a company that provides equity crowdfunding for non-accredited investors, and so they will take our platform. Oh, so you are subscribing to it then? Yes, uh, through a partner who's going to be doing that. Again, and I'm subscribing to it because this is creating a safety net, a, a, um, a, a qualifying approach for the non-accredited, non-professional investors. It's like a Moody score or a FICO score or a, you know, a way of UL certification. Can I trust that this company actually has been vetted by a, a lot of people who actually have expertise that I don't have and who are, you know, creating um, a level of confidence that I otherwise wouldn't be able to have. Who are you partnering with? Uh, I can't uh, name them yet, but they well, are when, one of the when largest. When can you? Mm, probably in the next six months or so. Okay. Yeah. Giving it to TechCrunch first? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Good. Um, Nick, you've seen the cra crowdfunding's taken off quite a lot. You, can't, you can go past it an advert on the tube for a Cedars, Cedars crowdfund. For, I, th I think I saw a golf bag or something the other day. What, um, what do you think is going on there? I actually had a, a small investment in Cedars back in my previous fund, so it's a space that, that we've looked at and watched well. So I think where it's ending up is that crowdfunding is, uh, has a really important place in the market, but it doesn't overlap that much with what VCs are trying to invest in. You know, for companies that are going to be very big, then crowdfunding, um, uh, it makes sense for a small number of them. So Monzo, one of the uh, unicorn successes here in, in, in London, uh, did a crowdfunding campaign to its customers, and you know, and that helps build some brand loyalty. So that kind of is helpful at the margin. But if you look at most of the activity on crowdfunding sites, it is it's small businesses raising money from um, from people they know, from like so coffee shops raising money from 10, 15, 20 grand from uh, from their customers, and and that's nice, and it helps fund that part of the market. But it is it's just a kind of different end to uh, to venture capital. Um, and uh, just in the closing five minutes, um, it's worth mentioning uh, that we all thought the whole thing would be replaced by, by ICOs about 18 months ago, that everything was going to be replaced by ICOs. Um, I'm talking, of course, about initial coin offerings in the blockchain space where entrepreneurs were raising billions and billions, billions of dollars. Do you think that the that that will come back because Bitcoin has come back. Um, do you think, or do you think that that all of that crowd, that sort of 
community crowdfunding st star stuff will you know dissipate because of well kick is being sued by the sec for starters right now and secondly um most of that crowdfunding was all about funding other blockchain projects wasn't it it didn't really enter the traditional internet space so um i think it will come back hopefully this time more cautiously and people would would be more aware of if this is a scam or if, if it's not and there'll be more kind of vetted companies and more qualified companies coming in i'm actually i think again similar to equity crowdfunding crypto icos is just another tool set for people to be able to have uh, ownership, maybe control, maybe governance in a startup company or in a company. Um, so I think that's, that's good uh, and that's helpful, but you know, we just need more uh, governance around it and more professional investors who help these companies go, go ahead and then giving the access to, to non-professional investors to also be able to enjoy the benefits. We were being very polite about the space because basically there was a bit of a shit show, <laughs> most of it, uh, for the last 18 months. What about, what about the, you must have seen some of the craziness over the last couple of years in, in blockchain and crypto. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it sort of it reminded me a little of the derivatives sort of yeah. meltdown where people didn't even know what they were investing in. And, and there was just, you know, generally it was a, almost a greedy land grab feeling about everyone was going to do an ICO and no one really understood what they were and what they were buying if they were uh, buying into it. So they, I think they're, the model, in theory, makes sense, but they're, again, the governance was lacking. No regulation. No regulation at all. It was, it was definitely not ready for prime time, but I am all for new models that sort of disrupt the status quo in the venture capital industry in the way that currently fundraising happens. Nick, are the VCs laughing on the side, other side of their face now that <laughs> blockchain didn't, didn't pop for a while? And depends how much money they put into blockchain companies, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> so See. some yes, some yes, some no. Uh, and so I think I think it will come back a bit, but I think like crowdfunding, it's going to be probably a relatively small part of the um, uh, of the overall startup landscape, and it's going to work well for businesses which um, which actually need a blockchain component to it, right? Some um, permissionless trust, uh, and and where it makes sense to have that kind of layer of infrastructure around it. So that's going to be some, but I don't think it's going to be huge with my prediction for the, for the next few years at least. Uh, let's, let's do um, a quick, round, uh, quick audience survey. Right, who here is an entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur? Put your hand up. Hi, hi. Don't, don't be so British. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay, uh, who here? Keep your hand up if you're fundraising right now. If you're an entrepreneur and you're fundraising. Right, uh, th those guys over there. Um, uh, put your hands down. Okay, put your hand up here. I don't expect anyone to put their hand up. Put your hand up if you're an investor. Oh! Okay, right. The guys, just put their hand up. They're after the money. Okay. Um, now, uh, quickly, um, put your hand up if you're... Uh, if you're uh, are there any women entrepreneurs in the, in the room right now? Okay, let's, let's do it. Get Ollie, let's get the... Now, are you raising money? Okay. What do you, what do you think about this subject that we've been talking about? It's amazing, um, and I'm very interested in what Kim is doing, actually. What, what interests you about what Kim was saying? Um, to find an index, basically, to predict. This index. It seems to me that, uh, thanks very much, Ollie. It seems to me that if you get this right, Kim, that you will actually create a kind, you'll sort of weaponize uh, a lot of the information about entrepreneurialism right now. Um, to the point where maybe it, you will find the needle in the haystack. One of the problems that I know lots of entrepreneurs are constantly trying to speak to investors, can't get through the front door. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of industry bias um, mm -hmm. from various, might, might be gender, it might be ethnicity, appalling discrimination often sometimes. Do you think that that's, this might solve some of that problem? That's, uh, that is what we're very hopeful is yeah. the case, because what we're doing is reducing ingrained bias. That sort of the number one first ingrained bias in venture investing is you have to know someone in the venture capital world. That, by definition, <laughs> reduces the number of people who get funding. Yeah. And then on top of that, there are all sorts of other things that happen once you enter into that funding process. So yes, Well, well certainly from my perspective, I think that one of the issues is always trying to get heard and understood as an entrepreneur. And I really do respect entrepreneurs when they 
when they uh, try and reach out to uh, investors and to journalists. And of course, it means that I always know that the, the entrepreneur is really keen when my Google Gmail inbox clicks up from one to two to three. I think that the entrepreneur really does want to talk to me about something. Um, okay, we don't, don't have any more time, but thank you very much for, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you all. Now, I'm just going to actually, Nick, stay where you are just for one second because I'm just going to take, please, Mike, just be two minutes, two minutes, because yeah. I want you to give us some food for thought. Uh, and let's give them a huge round of applause, all of our panel, but I'm looking for food for thought as we go into lunch. And here, here, my job is to channel the spirit of COGX across the morning. So my question to you as investors is, how do you prepare the companies you're funding to consider the moral and ethical implications of what they are creating? And that's a big question, right, Kim? But maybe just, just, just get us started as we go into lunch, because I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't join the dots across we're our COGX stages. We're on red. I know we're on red, Mike, but that's all right. <laughs> but to, to me, it's, 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 it's missing if it's not touched on. But Kim, just a, a, yeah. a, how you approach that. Uh, so the moral and ethical implications of the products they're, they're developing. Those are the kinds of questions that come up, come up during the conversation that occurs during this whole collective intelligence diligence yeah. session. And, and what's great is that you can directly confront slash challenge, you know, the entrepreneur to say, you know, what, what about fill in the blank ethically, you know, and I have concerns about this. And then others can, can join to that concern. And then to the entrepreneur, suddenly they realize, okay, this is an investment concern that I'm going to have to deal with, change my model, whatever right. it is. So that surfaced very early in the evaluation process. And Nick and Ali, it's easy to get the sense, isn't it, that more entrepreneurs are trying to solve big social problems with the ventures you're creating. I just wonder to what extent that reflects in your pipeline, in your investments. Is that a bit of a, a sort of a feel-good myth, or do you see it in no, reality? I, I think at least for us, it's, it's the big focus, actually. So we invest in deep, full of impact companies changing agriculture, changing space, ch changing our earth, uh, changing the weather and being against basically, you know, climate changes. Uh, so I think one big uh, kind of double-edged sword in AI is if there's no explainability, uh, it may tip either way. Mm -hmm. So one part of it, uh, of looking ethically is that. The other is, as early stage venture capitalists, we invest in people. So I think it's our job to better understand if, if those people have the moral kind of if they look at the moral consequences of what they're creating. Mm. And I want to know if Mike sees more of it as well. But Nick, what's your take on this? Because we're aligned to the global goals across COGX, but what are you saying? So uh, it's increasingly important for us from an investment perspective. So one of our most recent investments is a, a clean makeup brand. So uh, producing lipsticks initially without any of the harmful, often cancer, promoting ingredients that are in current makeups. <coughs> Mix to Pick itself is going to be manufactured in a solar panel uh, solar powered factory in LA and so the whole brand is very sustainable and, and that makes a lot of sense because it's what consumers want now and so that's the advice to founders so, you know the, your first question you know you should do this because a it's right and b it's going to help you build your business you'll have more loyal customers and it will help also with uh, with the exit fantastic uh, final question Mike Butcher you've been asking the questions today what one thing you're working on apart from writing for TechCrunch are you proud of and you think needs a wider audience what that I'm working on um, I've started a new nonprofit called Tech Vets, gets uh, ex-military veterans and service leavers into cybersecurity and technology. If you look up techvets.co or techvets, tech underscore vets on Twitter, you'll find out more about that and check it out. Amazing. So many good conversations in the room. Thank you, Mike, for leading us through that. And thank you to all of our panel. Great. Thank you.